This is True Crime Out Loud. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. And this week's case takes us to Houston, Texas, the fourth most populous city in the U.S. with 2,304,580 people as of the 2020 census. It's located in Harris County, Texas, and is home of the Houston Astros and Houston Texans. Houston also features the fifth tallest skyline in North America and is described as one of the most ethnically and culturally diverse cities in the U.S. Houston is also the home of another name that True Crime Out Loud listeners will be familiar with, Andrea Yates, who drowned her five children just outside of Houston, Texas on June 20th, 2001 after suffering from postpartum depression. And the case in Houston is going to focus around two people, Alf Stefan Anderson, 59 years old, who was born in Sweden. Anderson was a biochemist who was a research professor at the University of Houston specializing in women's health issues. He had immigrated into the U.S. in 1986 and had become a U.S. citizen in 1996. He had been married when he was in his 30s, but that marriage ended in divorce and he was described by his friends as a lifelong bachelor. The other person in this case, Ana Lilia Trujillo, 44 years old, was a native of Mexico who had been married and divorced twice and worked as a massage therapist in the Houston area. They met in August of 2012, and at the time, Trujillo was 15 years younger than Anderson. The case began on June 10th, 2013, at 3.39 a.m., a call came into Houston 911 and it lasted a total of seven minutes. In this 911 call, a woman is screaming for help and you can hear her saying, Breathe, Stefan, breathe. The dispatcher is telling the caller how to perform CPR and it sounded as if the caller might be trying to do this. Emergency personnel arrive at 3.58 a.m., which is 19 minutes after the 911 call first came in. So they go to this condo, and it's on the 18th floor of the building. When they go in, Trujillo shows them Stefan, who was lying in the hallway of his condo, and he was lying on a white carpet that had been soaked in blood. The table there that was in this hallway and the floor was splattered with blood. His face was unrecognizable and it appeared as though he had been severely beaten. He was pronounced dead on the scene shortly after medical personnel arrived. So the only two people there, we have Stefan, who is deceased, and Trujillo, and Police want to talk to her, so they take her to the police station. And about five hours after this 911 call comes in, they sit her down for a formal interview. She waived her Miranda rights and agreed to talk to police. As she began to talk to police, she did not know that Stefan had died. She starts out by telling police that she had been in several different relationships with men as friends, and they always became obsessed with her, and then they would become abusive. She called Stefan her fiancé and said that he had also become obsessed with her, but she said she had told him she didn't want to be romantically involved with him. Trujillo goes on to tell detectives that Stefan would drink heavily and would become mentally abusive. She said Stefan was like many male friends that she had in the past who wanted to marry her and turn this friendship into romance. Trujillo said she eventually grew to care for Stefan, but she wouldn't have sex with him because it was like sleeping with her grandfather. She told detective Stefan would do well for a while, but then he would relapse into this alcohol and self-destructive behavior. She said that evening on June 9th, they had been at a bar called Bodega's Taco, and she and Stefan were drinking tequila. She said another man bought her a drink, and this caused Stefan to become jealous, and it caused a fight between them. 
So they go back to his condo and get there about 2 a.m. where they argued. And then Trujillo started talking about going the next day to Waco to visit her daughter. And he thought that she was going to leave him. So this creates even more argument. It fuels the argument. She said that once they were at his condo, and I quote, his face got red, red. He got infuriated. You're not going to leave me, end quote. Trujillo said Stefan grabbed her and the two started wrestling in the hallway. She said she got away, but Stefan chased her down, got on top of her, and she could not breathe. She said Stefan was growling at her and she was begging him to let her go. She also told detectives Stefan lost his balance during this wrestling and she was able to get on top of him. She said he grabbed her and she was hitting him with her shoe, telling him, please stop. But Trujillo said she only hit Stefan because she knew he was going to get up and start to hurt her. Trujillo said she hit Stefan only a couple of times and then he grabbed her hand and she lost the shoe. She didn't even realize that he was hurt until she saw blood on the floor. Once she realized that he was bleeding, she began trying to save him and do mouth to mouth, and she called 911. And then once the interview was getting to an end, the detective informed Trujillo that Stefan was dead. So just as with any suspicious death or death investigation, an autopsy is going to be performed. And an autopsy was, in fact, performed on Stefan by Dr. Jennifer Ross, who determined that his cause of death was blunt force trauma to his head and facial trauma. She also concluded that the manner of death was homicide. And it's worth noting here that Homicide does not equal murder, necessarily. Homicide only means death at the hands of another. It could be justified homicide. Any self-defense case would be ruled by all, for autopsy purposes as a homicide. It doesn't necessarily mean that there was criminal intent to kill that person. The report also noted that there were 25 small lacerations and contusions that matched the tip of Trujillo's stiletto shoe. Trujillo had stabbed him repeatedly with a five and a half inch stiletto heel that came from the, her left shoe, which was a size nine. And it was a blue suede heel, which had tapered down to a small tip. There were also similar defensive wounds on his hands and wrists that indicated that some of the shoe strikes might have hit his arms as well. So the police are obviously going to be investigating further than just the autopsy and interview of Trujillo, and they retrieve video footage from inside the bar where Trujillo and Stefan had been the evening of his death. They spoke to a witness who was a cab driver that had taken Trujillo and Stefan to his condo from the bar that evening, and the driver said that Stefan had to go back inside the bar three times before he was able to finally get Trujillo to leave the bar and get in the cab. This was something that the police were able to corroborate by viewing the video footage from the bar. The cab driver also said that Trujillo was threatening Stefan during the cab ride and was just generally acting out, yelling profanities at him. The cab driver said that this was so out of control and concerning that she had asked Stefan to pray with her before he went into his condo. So based on the evidence, the police determined this was not a justifiable homicide. This was not a case of self-defense. Trujillo had attacked him and punctured him 25 times with a stiletto heel. So she was arrested and it comes to trial. Trujillo's defense said she was defending herself from an attack by Stefan. And if you get a chance, go online, search through YouTube, and look for her testimony in court. You can see this along with her interviews with the police. She said she had been repeatedly abused by men and even sexually assaulted. So she was scared. She said Stefan would get angry with her when he drank heavily. 
Now, they determined Stefan was on antidepressants and had heart disease for which he took beta blockers. And the prosecution did not question him being an alcoholic. I think there was no need to even argue that point. He had been to rehab for two months shortly after he started working at the University of Houston, and that was at the direction of the university. But he relapsed and would go back and forth between some sobriety and alcoholism. Her defense also argued the emergency personnel or the medics arrived 19 minutes after the first call came in. They were at the end of a long 24-hour shift, which is common for emergency personnel to work. And because they were at the end of the shift, they were tired that they didn't even bother to see if Stefan had a heartbeat by doing an EKG, which is usually done on the scene to pronounce someone deceased. They basically felt for a pulse, listened for a pulse, and determined he was deceased. Dr. Ross who did the autopsy, even said in court that it was possible for the stress of the beating to have caused an adrenaline rush, which in turn caused a heart attack. Prosecutors present that she had him pinned down and repeatedly stabbed him as she was on top of him, and he didn't fight back. He had defensive wounds, and she had no injuries on her body. They acknowledged, again, that Stefan was an alcoholic, but they brought forth witnesses who said he didn't become violent when drinking. He remained mild manner whether he was intoxicated or sober. They point out Trujillo had been arrested for driving while intoxicated and public intoxication. And they brought forth James Wells, a former boyfriend of Trujillo's, who said that Trujillo had attacked him and threatened him. He said her mood would change drastically when she was intoxicated. So the jury deliberated for two hours and found Trujillo guilty of murder, and she received the maximum sentence of life in prison. So a couple of things that stick out to me on this, I think I, I noticed immediately, you know, that she refers to him in her interview with police as her fiancé, yet said that they were not romantically involved and, and, and in fact said that she had no intention of having sex with him because it felt like it would be having sex with her grandfather even though let's face it this guy's only 15 years older than her he's really barely only biologically old enough to be her father so that's that struck me as odd an odd way for her to, to describe her relationship well I, I think that is odd, too, but I think also her interview wasn't conducted right away, so she had time to think about it. And if she's going to set up this defense, I'm not saying she did set up the defense. It very well could have been just like she said, but if she's going to set something up, okay, so I have people who've been abusive in the past, and they were just friends, and they became obsessed. I need to present Stefan as somebody who was being obsessed, and I really wasn't with him her saying fiance was probably like, oh crap, I shouldn't have called him fiance, but she did it. If like you pointed out, if we're going with the theory that maybe she had time to kind of craft a story, boy, she, she had a Freudian slip there when she said fiance. I wonder if anyone else was able to confirm whether or not they were actually engaged. Well, it kind of went back and forth. I mean, he was kind of a quiet guy, not very, very open publicly about things. I mean, people knew that they dated or, you know, had some sort of relationship but i mean it was confirmed by some and it was unconfirmed by others so you never know what to what to truly believe i will tell you what stuck out to me is that she was sentenced to life and her attorney argued you know this was a heat of passion you know even if she did stab him with a high heel shoe 25 times it was a, a heat of the moment it wasn't a premeditated thing but she was still sentenced to life in prison. Yeah, I, I think uh, my problem with that, though, I mean, I think it is the appropriate sentence because you have to pick your defense, right, as a defendant. So you can't say, you can't start off with, he jumped on me and, and I had to defend myself with my shoe. 
that is a self-defense defense. I mean, that's an affirmative defense. Yes, I killed him. Here's why I did it, because I had to. You can't, if that starts to come off the rails, then you can't at sentencing say, well, my self-defense thing didn't work, so don't give me a life sentence. This was a heat of passion thing. Remember, heat of passion just isn't a cool catchphrase. I mean, that is a recognized defense, all right? But it's usually not employed in this type of setting. So your typical heat of passion thing, like we've talked about on True Crime Out Loud before, is, you know, wife comes in, finds husband in bed with neighbor, shoots both of them. Heat of passion, okay? Everything leading up to her day at that point is normal, and boom, she sees this thing that shocks her so hard that she commits this horrible crime without even, you know, without even thinking about it, really. It just happens because she's so caught up in the heat of passion. That's different than, than self-defense. No one is caught up in the heat of passion when they're defending themselves. They're caught up in defending themselves. And since that kind of fell apart, in my opinion, it goes one of two ways. You either are actively defending yourself or you've killed that person. And that's what juries determine, whether you whether you were defending yourself or if you killed that person criminally. Well, I think her attorney did a, a good job of arguing both, that this was a self-defense case, but the reason that she stabbed him so many times was a heat of passion. Like once it once it started and because of her history of abuse, it just it just escalated and uh, in the heat of the moment she overdid it. And he did a good job of arguing it. Obviously, it didn't work. I don't know. I mean, it it's it, like any domestic violence case that we hear of with somebody killing their spouse. I don't think it was premeditated. I don't think she was in that cab ride home. Hey, I, I just, I'm so mad at him. When we get home, I'm going to stab him with my stiletto heel. I don't, I don't think it was that kind of case. Like we always go back to Chris Watts who, you know, said a few days before, I'm going to kill my wife. I don't think that was her plan. So, I mean, it's just an argument here is life sentence, a, a justifiable sentence, or should it be somewhere in between? And a little glimpse behind the curtain of the True Crime Out Loud podcast, Jen does the research exclusively, so she typically has a little more insight into the cases. So a lot of my commentary is spitballing, but I would say that the defense probably did not do a good job of proving that she was engaged by Stefan initially right did we ever even really prove that he attacked her or grabbed her or anything like that did we prove that at all and my issue with premeditation and and i think we've talked about this before and although laws vary from state to state i'm not aware of any where there's a a determined amount of time okay so premeditation is is just formulation of a plan it, it might take 30 seconds she may have said something or he may have said something to her. She walks into other room and says, you know what? I'm going to take this shoe. I'm going to beat him to death with it. That's premeditation. While some cases are or dear or dear in the crime. You can. Well, or some cases are planned months in advance. You know, they'll put this elaborate scheme together and they're, they're, they're both premeditated cases. Um, so there is no legal. There is no legal thing that says that she has to think about it a certain amount of time before carrying it out for it to qualify as premeditation. Once she formulates a plan and executes that plan, that's premeditation. Well, here's my opinion of what I think. I think you have two intoxicated people who are arguing to whatever level. No physical altercation has occurred. At some point, something happens. She gets her shoe off. And she starts stabbing him. I don't I don't know that in her head she's saying, I'm going to stab him with my shoe until he dies. It might have very well been, I am so angry at this guy, I'm just going to keep beating him. You know, I don't know that it was, I'm going to murder him. I want him to die by doing this. My opinion. Well, and I think it was just two drunk people and she was a drunk, angry woman taking out her vengeance on this guy. 
what what do you think happened? Do you think that this was like I said it was, or do you think something different? I I think that I mean I I agree with you that it's two intoxicated people who were probably arguing. I think that without some type of independent verification, and the prosecution was able to present her having a history of reacting violently when intoxicated, although we don't hear any mention of anyone backing up. No one other than her said that he's violent That's when, correct. when he's drunk, right? So, And you got the taxi cab driver whose testimony obviously leans towards her being the aggressor, I mean, leaving the bar. So, you know, you really got nothing. You, you really have nothing to say that... He sparked off the com the, confronta the physical confrontation or anything. It could be that, that she lost her temper and beat him to death with her shoe. Yeah, uh, but we also have nothing to say that he didn't spark off. I mean, just yeah. because there's no history there doesn't mean it didn't happen. Well, but that, you that's have to true. go with what a reasonable right. person's going to believe. Right. Well, and we're in a world, I mean, we're operating in a world that has to go off evidence. Okay, yeah. so, so nothing's impossible. Could he have lost his temper? Sure, but, you know. It, it, she had no marks on her. She had no marks on her, and she has a history of overreacting. Now, she would probably say that, you know, that this James Wells guy didn't treat her right. So, you know, who knows? Take that for what it's worth. The taxi cab driver is obviously independent. She doesn't know either one of them. But she was, it's telling to me. That, that is, yeah, you're thinking the same it way It is I telling am. to me that she is so shocked at this woman's behavior that she wants to pray with this guy before he goes up to his condo. Now, I hadn't ridden in a bunch of taxis, but I don't know that I've really exchanged conversation with any taxi driver or Uber driver of any substance. I mean, hey, are you having a good day? Yep. I mean, and you think about all the things that a taxi cab driver or an Uber driver sees. People fight in the back of a taxi commonly. I mean, verbally, you know, argue with each other. And they see people in a taxi when they're sad, uh, you know, upset about something or when they're really happy or, or whatever. But I doubt this, unless this woman just prays with everyone who rides in her taxi cab. And I didn't get that impression. I Well, and... You were thinking along the same lines. I was thinking a taxi cab driver in the city of Houston, it's enough to make her take pause and say, whoa, this is kind of way out there. I mean, and I have ridden in several taxis in several different large cities in the U.S., but there used to be that show on HBO where they would do like taxi cab confessions. And you see all these different shows in taxi cabs or drivers talking about stories of things that happen. And for this to be major enough for her to, to want to pray about it. I mean, yeah, taxi cab drivers see some strange stuff. And if it is something that's so severe that we just want to full stop, have a prayer with this guy must have been pretty bad. Well, again, tragic case. I mean, a, a, another case of domestic violence, which, you know, is an, um, a large problem in all of the world, not just the U.S., but all of the world that domestic violence is, is a major problem. And it's sad. Um, it's an unusual case that she chose to stab him with a five and a half inch stiletto heel. But it does the same thing as a knife. Well, and I think this is a good example of domestic violence kind of working in an unconventional direction because the victim is is a male. And, I mean, we know with history and law enforcement that males certainly can be victims, although the more majority of the time they're not. But this case is a pretty stark illustration of a male domestic violence victim. That That's all we have for this week. I want to give a shout out again to our friend Heather at watching Netflix without you. And I'm going to play her trailer here for you. Hi there. It's Heather from watching Netflix without you, the podcast. There are over 1200 Netflix original feature films and documentaries, and that number is only growing. So I've made it my mission to watch as many as I possibly can. And with a delightful guest or guests in each episode, rate, review, and discuss each film. And that's about it. You can listen to Watching Netflix Without You on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. 
We hope you enjoyed this week's case, and as always, we'll see you next week. We would like to hear your thoughts on this and all of our cases, and as always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com, Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud, outloud is two words, not one, and Twitter at tcoutloud. Photos, links, and sources for this case can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com.